Hey, so here we are, video six. We're gonna look at ideal gas processes, the four processes we're gonna look at, isochoric, isobaric, isometric, and adiabatic. Let's get right to it. Okay, so let's start with isochoric processes. An isochoric gas process means that the gas is kept at a constant volume, like you've got it in this sealed up container right here, uh, and, and you heat it up, you add heat energy to it, it increases the pressure of the gas. From a small particle perspective, you're adding energy into that gas, so those little gas particles are zipping around faster and faster, hitting the sides of the container and one another more and more, so that increases the pressure of that gas. Now, each of these gas processes can be represented individually on a PV diagram. For an isochoric process, if we're talking about constant volume and we change the pressure by adding heat energy, we'll increase the pressure. Taking heat energy out will decrease the pressure. So on a PV diagram, an isochoric process will show up as a vertical line. And typically, we're given an arrow showing us the direction that that process is happening. So we're going from uh, lower pressure to higher pressure. So from this graph, we can tell that we're adding energy to it. And because the volume stays constant, that energy is being added in the form of heat energy, which tells us no mechanical work is being done in this isochoric process. An, isochor an example of an isochoric process would be like driving around on a cold day, right? I brought that up in the previous video. You get into a car and you, it's a cold morning and you start driving for 30 minutes and the pressure changes in the car's tires. That's an isochoric process because the volume of gas in the tire stays constant and you've increased the temperature by driving around, and which will increase the pressure. Now, a lot of gas processes can take place at a constant, unchanging pressure. A constant pressure, then, we call an isobaric process. One way to produce an isobaric process is shown in this picture here, where a gas is in a sealed uh, cylinder, okay? And then there's what we call a, a, a piston here that slides up and down in that cylinder. The piston then can uh, compress or expand that gas. So when that piston then is at equilibrium, the pressure is gonna be the same on both sides of the piston. We add heat energy into that gas then. Because the external pressure outside the piston doesn't change, the gas pressure remains constant as that gas expands and moves that piston up. So the motion of this piston involves work. If we do work on the piston, we can make it move. If the gas expands or if it's compressed, causing the piston to move, then work is done on that piston. So on a PV diagram, an isobaric process appears as a horizontal line. Because we've got constant pressure, our volume changes. Again, the arrow is telling us we're going in this direction. So this is what we'd call an isobaric expansion. If the gas process were going the other direction, we're taking heat energy out, causing the gas to compress, then that we'd call, we call this an isobaric compression. Okay, and then we've got isothermal processes. An isothermal process is a constant temperature process. One possible isothermal process is illustrated here. A piston is being pushed down to compress a gas, but the gas cylinder is submerged in a large container of liquid that's held at a constant temperature. If the piston is pushed slowly, then the heat energy transfer through the walls of the cylinder will keep the gas at the same temperature as the surrounding liquid. So this would be an isothermal compression. If the reverse process were to happen, the piston is slowly pulled out, that would be an isothermal expansion. Representing an isothermal process on a PV diagram is a little bit more complicated because both uh, pressure and volume change. So as long as temperature is fixed, then we have this relationship here, showing an inverse relationship between the pressure and the volume. So because there is an inverse relationship between the pressure and volume, the graph of an isothermal process is a hyperbola. Okay, so this 
uh, PV diagram shows us an isothermal compression. We know it's an isothermal compression because our, it's showing that our, our final pressure is greater than our initial pressure and our final volume is less than our initial volume. So this has got to be an isothermal compression. An isothermal uh, expansion would move in the opposite direction. Now the graph of an isothermal process is called an isotherm. And this isotherm shown here shows us that the hyperbola of the PV graph uh, depends on the value of the temperature. If we use a higher constant temperature for the process, the isotherm will move further away from the origin of the PV diagram. So this figure is showing us three isotherms for uh, this process at three different temperatures. A gas undergoing an isothermal process will move along an isotherm for the appropriate temperature. Okay, so before we look at adiabatic processes, let's talk about work real quick. When the spark plug fires in a cylinder of your car, it ignites the gas-fuel-air mixture inside. The hot gas expands. It pushes the piston out and through various mechanical linkages, turning the wheels of your car. As the gas expands, it does work on the piston. Similarly, the gas in the figure here does work as it lifts the mass on the piston. So PV diagrams are really useful for calculating the work done by a gas. Now we know that work equals force times distance. We can apply this idea to a gas. This figure here shows then a gas cylinder sealed at one end by a movable piston. And the force of that gas is due to the gas pressure. Well, we know that the pressure is the force divided by the area that it acts on. And we can rearrange this to get the force exerted by the pressure. We also know that the definition of work is force times distance. We can combine these and get work equals the pressure times the area times the distance. This distance is a vertical distance. It's the height of that cylinder. So we recognize immediately that this area times the height of the cylinder is a change in volume. So putting that in here, we get pressure times the change in volume. So we now found that for an isobaric process, the work that's done is equal to the pressure multiplied by the change in volume, which we see represented right here. Now, this equation has a particularly simple interpretation on a PV diagram. What it shows is that the, air, the, the work done is the area under a PV diagram. And what we need to recognize here is for that simple uh, definition of pressure times change in volume, that works only for an isobaric process, right? And if we've got, say, an adiabatic process, we would have to find the work done by taking the geometry of the uh, area under that uh, curve. It also shows us some really important points that we need to understand. First, in order for work to be done, the volume of the gas has to change. So in an isochoric process where the, our volume never changes and our, our PV diagram is just going to be a vertical line, right? No work is done in an isochoric process. This is no mechanical work. There's still a heat energy transfer, but no uh, mechanical work is done. Second, the relationship of this uh, applies only to these constant pressure processes, isobaric processes. To calculate the work, then, the pressure has to be in pascals, and the volume must be in cubic meters. The work done by a gas is positive if the gas expands. So here we're showing an isobaric uh, expansion. This would be positive work. The work done by the gas is negative if the gas compresses. So in an isobaric compression, that work would be negative. All right, so now we can draw ourselves to adiabatic processes. So you, you may have noticed that you've ever, if you've ever used a bicycle tire with hand pump to pump up bicycle tires, the pump gets warm. The reason for that is when you press down on the handle of the pump, a piston in the pump's chamber compresses that gas. According to the first law of thermodynamics, then doing work on the gas increases its thermal energy. So the gas temperature goes up 
and heat is then transferred through the walls of the pump to your hand. Now, suppose you compress a gas in an insulated container so that no heat is exchanged with the environment. Or you compress a gas so quickly that there's no time for heat to be transferred. In either case, the heat energy is zero. If a gas process has heat energy zero for either a compression or an expansion, we call that an adiabatic process. So adiabatic processes allow you to use work rather than heat to change the temperature of a gas. An adiabatic expansion lowers the temperature of a gas and an adiabatic compression raises the temperature of a gas. They're quite common processes too. And there's two simple ways then to have one take place. First, the system can be insulated so that he can not enter or leave, such as Joule's heat equivalent experiment. Also, the adiabatic process happens really quickly, so there's no time for heat to be transferred, such as in a combustion uh, engine. You can easily test out uh, adiabatic processes by doing this little activity here. If you hold out your hand and then puff air into the palm of your hand, the air feels warm. Then you compress your lips and blow over your, over your hand uh, like here, that air feels cool. The explanation of this is that this is an adiabatic expansion, right? The air that's puffed out of your lungs felt warm because it was warm. It gained heat from the warm blood of your lungs. The air coming out of your pursed lips were, was compressed in your mouth. When it came out of, of your mouth, it expanded at, through an adiabatic expansion and lost internal energy, so it cooled. All right, so those are our gas processes. Uh, make sure you uh, go through and take notes and listen to the video as many times as you need to. See you in class.